Welcome to this lecture in Stochastic Finance. I'm going to uh, cover uh, the basics in uh, continuous time finance and uh, in the next lectures we are going to move on to portfolio choice and the basics of stochastic control. So let's start with the simplest of all continuous time process for stochastic finance which is the Bachelier model. It is even older than the use of Banyan motion for physics and it goes back to this French mathematician Louis Bachelier who first proposed Brownian motion, possibly with the drift, as a model for stochastic uh, processes followed by stock prices. So Bachelier was thinking about the prices of stocks and bonds in the Paris bourse and uh, at the time he was really walking on thin ice because Brownian motion was not even well defined and yet he had the uh, intuition to uh, work with it without uh, uh, having a uh, well-defined um, mathematical concept. Now, the main idea of uh, Bachelier, which took off in uh, more developed models, was that uh, stock prices have independent increments, which are one of the defining features of binary motion, and that the variance of price increments is typically proportional to time, which is another feature of binary motion. So, in modern terms, the stock price under the Bachelier model is described by these components. There is some initial constant value, some deterministic drift, a constant mu in this case, and uh, some multiple of a Brownian motion which controls the variance of the process itself. So the model itself was quite groundbreaking at the time, but for modern applications it has two major problems. Okay? So the first major problem is that it implies expected returns which decline to zero over time. Okay? So if you look at the conditional increment, so if you sit yourself at time capital T and you look at what is the expected return between capital T and the capital T plus delta, you see that this is going to zero as capital T keeps going. And this is counterfactual, because if you look at uh, what has happened over the last 100 years or 200 years, stock prices have kept, on average, constant returns. The returns have not gone to zero. Okay? So this is the main problem. The second problem, which is you know, theoretically even uh, bigger, but in practice less important, is that the price under the Bachelier model can become negative, okay? And this is against the law because limited liabilities uh, imply that stockholders cannot be liable for holding stocks, okay? Uh, at most, they can lose the entire investment, but their investment cannot become negative at any time, okay? So, this is why Samuelson modified Bachelier model in the 50s and he was one of the first to rediscover Bachelier work which had become uh, largely forgotten, at least in his own country. And uh, what Samuelson proposed to correct uh, these two flaws of the Bachelier model is to use not arithmetic bunny motion, which would have been Bachelier, but geometric bunny motion. So, geometric Brownian motion, here it is described informally, it essentially means that the return, not the price increment, is described by um, Brownian motion with drift. So, we know that the price, the relative price increase, not the absolute price increase, has a constant component described by a drift mu and some other stochastic component, again, described by a multiple of a Brownian motion. Now, the main difference here is that at this point we have positive prices, and this is something that you can figure out immediately by a simple application of Ito's formula. Okay? You see immediately that the expression of the stock price as a function of the initial value and uh, the uh, two parameters and the binary motion is given by this exponential, which is by definition strictly positive. 
And secondly, you also can observe that the returns here are constant. Okay, so the conditional expected returns here are constant, unlike the Bachelier model. So we do not have the counterfactual implication that expected returns conditionally are going to zero. Okay, so this is basically the workhorse of stochastic finance and. Uh, Anything that you cannot prove in more generality, you typically try to prove in this setting. And uh, anything that you can understand in this setting typically is something that has some application. Okay? So what we're going to do now is to do some uh, fundamental uh, treatment of what continuous trading is all about. Because before one can work in a model such as Samuelson without making logical mistakes, one needs to have a clear idea of what is a trading strategy and uh, what is an admissible trading strategy and what is not an admissible trading strategy. Okay? So in one period models you do not have any of these problems because in one period models the clock is ticking discreetly and so you can just say a strategy is the number of shares I have at the beginning and uh, I can choose that arbitrarily. I do not have to make any restrictions. And the, dis the description of a training strategy is quite simple. It is basically a stochastic process that is arbitrarily valued in the various um, discrete times that are present. So when we are in continuous time, this situation becomes a lot more Hazy. Because if you do not put restrictions on the trading strategies, you can reach a lot of paradoxes. For example, if you have a continuous finite interval, 0, 1, essentially you can trade infinitely many times. So if you have continuous time, you face the same problems that you would face if you had discrete but infinite time. So if you had an uh, infinite number of discrete dates. In particular, you have a major problem that you have to overcome, which is the so-called doubling strategies problem. And uh, this basically means that if you are able to execute a doubling strategy in a continuous time or in a discrete time model, you can reach any payoff you want, starting from any other payoff which makes a mockery of the entire optimal investment problem. Okay? So before we can actually stu study sensibly an optimal investment problem, we need to understand what is allowed and what is not allowed. Otherwise, we are essentially uh, fooling ourselves into uh, believing that something is optimal when, in fact, it can always be improved by just adding some doubling strategy to it. Okay? So, Another issue with the continuous trading is that uh, it is not really clear what is a trading strategy because you do not have to uh, trade at finite amounts. Okay? So you do not have to uh, buy a certain number of shares at a certain time. You can trade in a number of ways. You can uh, trade at a constant rate, for example, which means that uh, the uh, number of shares could be you know, absolutely continuous in time. And you can do even more weird things, such as having a finite variation strategy which does not have any derivative. So you can have counter-like behavior. So we need to understand what is exactly a trading strategy in continuous time, and I'm going to do this with the minimal amount of technical details now. So let's start with the problem that we have to solve, the uh, doubling strategies. Okay, so suppose we have infinite discrete time, which is the simplest setting to consider here. And we have one stock which has a price in equal, initially equal to 1. So suppose also that this is just a simple underwalk. So at each time increment, the price can either go up by 1 or can go down by 1. And the two movements are equally likely. You start with 0 euros. So you have nothing. And you want to come up with a strategy which makes one euro for sure. Okay? So if you can do something like this, this is called an arbitrage. Because you start with zero investment, you make a sure profit. And therefore, if you are in a situation like this, 
any optimal investment problem is not well posed because for any candidate optimal strategy you can add this strategy which costs nothing and uh, you will have something which is even better okay assuming that you prefer more to less so how do we construct such a strategy well here it is relatively straightforward you borrow one euro and you buy one share which costs exactly one euro if the stock goes up then game over now you have two euros you return one euro that you borrowed and the rest is a profit you go home and it's over if you don't win then you lose which means that now the stock price has gone from one to zero but you had borrowed that uh, euro so now your wealth is minus one so what do you do now you increase your number of shares by one so before you had one share now you have two shares if the stock goes up so if it returns to price one now you have two you can cover your previous loss of one and you make one and you go home again okay if you are unlucky for two times in a row what happens well you double again now you have four shares if you win you can cover your previous losses which were one plus two equal three so you still have one left and then you, you can quit you lose again you understand what's going on you're going to increase your position to eight now your losses amount to one plus two plus three which is seven if you win you will go home again and uh, you keep doing this infinitely many times and if you can play this game infinitely many times you are 100 percent sure that you will win because at each time the probability of winning is one half conditionally on having you having lost earlier which means that at the end the probability of winning sooner or later is always one so you have an arbitrage okay so what is the problem with this first of all you need infinitely deep pockets okay if you have a finite amount of money and uh, you cannot borrow beyond a certain level you cannot play this game infinitely many times okay and uh, if you have finite pockets well most of the time you are going to win one euro but the time that you lose you're going to lose a lot of money okay and the amount of money that you're going to lose when you lose compensates exactly the num the amount of wealth that on average you make when you win one euro okay so if you cannot play it infinitely many times and you do not have infinitely many infinitely deep pockets then this is not attractive at all it becomes attractive only if you can play this infinitely many times so motivated by this example we give the definition of a demissimo strategy okay an admissible strategy is a process okay, such that the stochastic integral vt equals integral of theta in ds is defined okay first condition second condition the resulting stochastic integral is greater or equal than minus x where x is a fixed constant okay which enters the admissibility definition almost surely for all times okay and v is defined as the portfolio process now notice that i did not specify the measurability conditions here on the stochastic process state i did not say this has to be predictable adapted or any other things i simply said it has to be integrable okay depending on the stochastic process that you're dealing with then this integrability will uh, specify what are the measurability requirements in particular if you're dealing with burning motion then the integrability boils down to the following condition you want that theta is adapted and that the integral of theta squared is finite almost surely and this guarantees that you can define the stochastic integral almost surely okay if you're dealing with something else which is not necessarily about emotion which is possibly a semi martingale then uh, you will uh, need other measurability requirements typically what you need is that theta is predictable but that is not enough you also need the, the uh, stochastic process the stochastic integral sorry to be uh, well defined which requires further conditions 
Okay, so if you have any questions, please stop me anytime. I'll be able, uh, happy to answer them, but you need to use the microphone. Okay. Now, the idea of this restriction here that the stochastic integral has to be bounded for below is that with this condition we hope to eliminate any doubling strategy from the market okay so what does it mean that we uh, hope to eliminate any doubling strategy it means actually that we hope to avoid any form of arbitrage from such a market when this is the definition of a missable strategy okay and we are going to see how this plays out with this definition okay so to do this we need to uh, give uh, some uh, reminder of the definition of local martingale I presume you are all uh, um, familiar with the definition of martingale so local martingale is a minor variation of this uh, in terms of uh, definition in practice it has some uh, quite uh, different properties anyway let's get going a local martingale is a stochastic process for which there exists a sequence of stakely increasing stopping times converging to plus infinity almost surely so we stop the process later and later and later and eventually we stop it arbitrarily later so that the stopped process mt inf tau n so each of these stochastic processes that you obtain by stopping the process m a time tau n this mt inf tau n is a true martingale okay so when you're looking at each of the stop processes you know that this is a martingale for sure when you are looking at the process that is not stopped all bets are off okay so there's no guarantee that the process itself if you don't stop it is going to be a martingale and in fact it doesn't have to be so Ideally, if you have a martingale, then this is also a local martingale. You just stop it at deterministic times, or you do not even stop it. But having tau n equal to plus infinity is not allowed, so you have to take tau n equal to n. Now, for continuous processes, if the process is not continuous, then the intuition here is very hazy. Okay, but if the process is continuous, there is an intuition that is relatively clear for what is a ma local martingale as opposed to a martingale so you can think of a martingale as a process that when you look at it on any discrete grid is a fair game okay so the increments have always conditional average zero okay so you cannot win by playing from any time to any other time fixed deterministic times a local martingale doesn't quite work like that in particular, the conditional increments are not guaranteed to have conditional means zero. They can be positive or negative, depends on what's going on with uh, the um, sign of the process. But if you stop the continuous process at fixed price levels, okay? So if you look at the process not on a time grid, but on a space or since we're talking about finance price grid and you define the first time that the process hits for example um, suppose the process starts at zero you look at the first time it either hits one or minus one and then you look at the first time that it uh, hits the next integer since the closest integer since the last it hit so if it hit one you look at the fir ti first time that it hits either zero or two and so on and so forth if you look at this discrete time process that you have obtained by stopping the process over a price grade then this becomes indeed a matting okay if you're dealing with a continuous local matting so essentially it is a process which has the tendency to uh, stray very quickly with uh, possibly low probability but that if it is appropriately stopped from straying too much then it is indeed a matic okay and this is in fact the way that you construct these stopping times when you are dealing with a continuous local matic anyway i'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, um, local martingales here 
what we are going to do is to require this proposition which I am not going to uh, prove and which you can find in any book on stochastic integration the proposition says that if you are dealing with a continuous local matting okay, each word is important here continuous and local matting and theta is an s-integrable process then also the stochastic integral is a local matting okay? so we're going to need this property which basically means that the local matting property is a property that is preserved under stochastic integration so if you look at Martingale, if you take the integral of a Martingale, that's generally not automatic. Okay? But the integral of a local Martingale is still a local matting. So in particular, the integral of a Martingale will not necessarily be a Martingale, will just be a local matting. Okay? It is something that can be preserved when you integrate, and unlike the Martingale property, it remains stable. <coughs> okay. Have any questions? Just go ahead. So the proposition we prove now, using this uh, um, fact from stochastic integration, is that if we have a continuous price process with a Martingale measure, and we take theta to be an admissible strategy in the previous sense, okay, so that it is integrable and uh, the integral is bounded from below, then the integral cannot be an arbitrage. Okay, so this is basically the result that we want to be safe with the well posedness of the continuous time finance strategies that we want to consider. So the proof is a two liner essentially once you put everything together. So let's consider Q to be the mounting and measure that we are talking about because we are assuming that it exists. And now we can say that VT, the stochastic integral of theta in DS, is a local mounting bounded from below. Why is it bounded from below? By definition, because theta is an invisible strategy. Okay? And because if Q is an equivalent, sorry, here I forgot to write equivalent, okay? It should be an equivalent mathematical measure, so it has to have the same sets of measure zero as the original measure P. So if Q is our mathematical measure, then the sets of measure zero are the same, so almost surely in the sense of P is the same as almost surely in the sense of Q. So if it is bounded from below the integral in the sense of P, almost surely, it is a bounded for below also in the sense of Q, almost surely. Now, what we can say is also that this stochastic integral is a local martingale because of the proposition we have just taken as granted. And so we can take, in particular, a sequence of stopping times tau n, which make this process Vt a real martingale. Okay, not just local, but a true matting. So at this point, we can say that the expected value under Q of Vt okay, is equal to the expected value of the limit as n goes to plus infinity of the integral between 0 and t inf tau n, because we know that by, the, by construction tau n is converging to plus infinity. So this is almost surely equal to this. Okay. We also know that this is bounded from below, so we can use Fatou's lemma and we can bring the limit outside the integral and we're going to get something which is possibly bigger. Okay? And at this point, what we're dealing with here is the expected value of a true martingale, because we have assumed that tau n are the reducing stopping times of this martingale vt, and this expected value is zero by the martingale property because the initial value of this martingale is precisely zero. Okay, so this proposition tells us that if we have a continuous process with an equivalent martingale measure, then we are guaranteed that the admissible strategies will never be 
arbitrages, and in particular, any strategy that is trying to achieve something like a doubling strategy will necessarily fail. Okay? So, if you want to check an implication of this argument, which basically proceeds with the same proof, and it is also important in finance, is that you can see that a local martingale bounded from below is a super martingale. Okay? This is easy to see, it's essentially the same argument. And uh, it is also a fact that we're going to need later. Okay? Now, if you are working in continuous time, the question is whether it is, is it even possible to construct something like these doubling strategies we have described earlier in continuous rather than, fi than finite discrete time. Okay? It is possible, and this is why we need to have these restriction of trading strategies. Let me give you a quick construction of how a continuous uh, doubling strategy in continuous time looks like. Take, for example, the, st the price to be Brownian motion itself. Brownian motion itself is the, the process that certainly cannot be cheated. Okay? So, if you find something that beats a uh, Brownian motion, it means that there's something really wrong with the definition of trading strategy. So, let's take a number of shares equal to theta, and let's define the portfolio value as usual, the integral of theta and dw. And now let's pick theta to be this formula. We wait until vt reaches 1. Okay? vt is starting from 0, so it will certainly start below 1. And as long as it doesn't hit 0, and this is a continuous process, so we know that for a while it will not hit, zero, will hit 1, as long as it is, doesn't hit 1, then we take theta t to be a deterministic function, which is square root of capital T, where capital is some arbitrary horizon. You can take it equal to whatever you want, 1, 1 half, or anything. We take 1 over square root of capital T minus little t. Okay? So it starts at uh, t equals 0. It starts at 1 over square root of capital T. And it keeps going up deterministically until not theta itself, but its integral will reach some specified level. Here I have used one. At that point, theta will stop, meaning that it will become identically zero onwards. Okay? So <coughs> the question is whether this is going to work. Okay? Now, it is certainly going to work on the event where vt hits 1, okay? Because if vt hits 1, then by definition, once the moment that vt hits 1, then theta t becomes 0, and uh, v capital T will be automatically equal to v at the time 1 was hit, which is 1, okay? So the only thing that we have to prove to check that this is a the doubling strategy is to see that the quitting time, so the first time that vt is equal to 1, this is actually strictly less than capital T, almost surely. Okay? So we have to check that vt is eating 1 certainly before capital T. And the basic idea here is that this is happening because the integral of the square of theta t is reaching plus infinity at time capital T. Okay? And I will show you why this is happening exactly. Okay. So, first observation is that if we define mt to be the integral between 0 and little t of the strategy we have defined earlier before it is stopped, so square root of capital T minus s in dws, then this is a time change by any motion. So this is uh, trivial. Uh, you just use um, Levy's criterion. You know that this is a martingale. You know that the quadratic variation is identically equal to t. Therefore, it is by motion. End of story. <coughs> so in particular, 
you can see that MT is not just any time change, it is this time change. Okay, so you can write explicitly what is the time change which makes um, um, time change by motion. So, sorry, in particular here you have to um, apply the VIS criterion not to M but to B. Okay, so I um, was imprecise earlier. So what is this time change doing? Well, as little t is moving from zero to capital T, for little t equals zero, you see that here you get log of one, which is zero, okay? And you also see that this function here, it is increasing from zero to plus infinity, as little t is increasing from zero to capital T. So this, is, this time change is just a map from the interval zero capital T to the interval zero plus infinity. An increasing map, of course. So we are called from you know, well-known facts about Brownian motions that if you start a Brownian motion at time zero, sooner or later it will hit any level, both positive and negative. So if you take the limit of Brownian motion, you get minus infinity. If you take the limb soup, you get plus infinity for almost every path. Okay. So these are things that. I'm not going to prove, but you can find uh, anywhere uh, on Brownian motion. So in particular, if this is true for Brownian motion, then it is true that as t varies between 0 and capital T, then also m visits any level, OK? Because m is visiting between 0 and capital T all the places that b is visiting between 0 and plus infinity. So, in particular, this means that mt will hit 1 with probability 1 before t reaches capital T. Okay? So, this is coming directly from the fact that with this time change, we have embedded a uh, binary motion between 0 and plus infinity into an interval between 0 and capital T. Okay. So, if you do not put restrictions on trading strategies that forbid such phenomena from happening, you can build arbitrages very easily, even with a Brownian motion. Okay? And what is, of course, the limit of an arbitrage, as it were, like this one, it is that you keep taking more and more risk, as in an old-fashioned doubling strategy, until you hit one, but if it happens that your price path is going down, your volatility becomes higher and higher, and uh, you can go lower and lower with uh, any without any bound. Okay, so this is why we need these definitions, and at this point, we can focus on what are the properties of arbitrage free markets. Okay. So in particular, we can look at what is happening when you have a strategy which is strictly greater than zero, almost surely, at a certain horizon. And we can ask ourselves, is it possible that this is strictly greater than zero at some horizon, capital T, but that perhaps it goes negative with some probability before then. Okay? Why is this important? Because suppose that you want to describe trading strategies just by their terminal payoff. If you specify some property for their payoff, does that tell you anything about the stochastic process which is actually generating this payoff or not? So, if you don't have a property like this, you have no guarantees about what the process is doing before the horizon, just from some information about what it is doing at the horizon. Okay? And in fact, in general, you don't have any such guarantees. But, if you have a stochastic process which is arbitrary, in the sense that we have described earlier, 
then you have this remarkable property in that if you have a payoff that is strictly greater than zero, almost surely, then it must be strictly greater than zero, almost surely, at any previous time. Okay? So you can just say, I'm going to consider all the payoffs that are strictly greater than zero, and then you are guaranteed that the trading strategy that will generate that payoff, or any trading strategy that will generate that payoff, will have to be strictly positive all the time. So how does the proof go? Well, we go by the contradiction. So suppose that there is some event with positive probability, so that for some little t, strictly smaller than capital T, this event is possible. Okay? So it is possible that Vt will go below zero at some time before t. Well, then what do you do? Well, to prove that something is impossible, you try to make an arbitrage out of that. Okay? So how do you make an arbitrage out of this event? Well, at the time little t, you have gone below zero, but now you have the certainty that at time capital T, you will be strictly above zero. Okay? So what do you do? You buy. You buy mathematically means that you consider the trading strategy which only on the event A takes a certain the, your strategy theta, the one that generates the payoff V, okay, between the time little t and capital T, and zero before and also zero afterwards unless A is happening. Okay? So you wait until at time t at time t, you know whether A is happening. If it is not happening, you do nothing. You keep zero all the time. If A is happening at time little t, then now you start following the strategy theta that is defining V. Now, if you take the integral of theta, it is the same as the integral of... Sorry, the integral of eta is the same as the integral of theta between small t and big T. And this is, by definition, strictly greater the zero, well, by hypothesis, on this event A, and it is zero otherwise, so you have a payoff which is either zero with positive probability or strictly greater than zero with positive probability, and this is what we call an arbitrage, so it is not possible. Okay? So this is an important property which tells you that in an arbitrage free market, the final payoff guarantees the properties of the process before the final payoff. Okay? So what you know about a random variable, you in fact know about an entire stochastic process. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the next definition we're going to need to study portfolio choice is the concept of stochastic scan factor. Okay? Stochastic scan factor, in full generality, is just a process MT such that when you multiply this process by any asset that you have in your market, so if you have in your market, for example, D plus one assets, conventionally we take the zeroth asset to be the risk free asset, okay, and all the other D assets from one to D to be the risky assets, but that's just a convention. All of the assets at the same time are martingales, okay? Not local martingales, but real martingales. And you want the process MT to be non-trivial, in the sense that it has to be different from zero, almost surely for all T. Why? Because otherwise you could always satisfy this by taking MT equal to zero. Zero multiplied by anything gives you zero, which will always be a martingale, okay? But that doesn't count as stochastic scan factor. Okay, you have to be, you have to find something which is never zero, and still gives you this property. As a matter of fact, we are going to use most of the time also the condition that MT has to be strictly greater than zero. Okay, this is not required in certain settings, but uh, um, for most applications, it happens to be the case. Related 
concept to that of a stochastic scan factor is a Martingale measure. Martingale measure is a probability Q equivalent to P such that S tilde, which is the, I did not define it here, but let me define it now. It is defined as SI divided by S0, so it is the discounted price of the ith asset using the zeroth asset as discounting asset, okay, discounting value, so that the discounted values are Q martingales for all i's, okay? So for i equals zero, this becomes trivial because you get S0 divided by S0, which is one, which is guaranteed to be a martingale because it's a constant. So the condition is non-trivial only for the i's which run from one up to d. Okay. So, this is the same story as in one period models, but now you have a more complicated relationship because in one period models you only require that the payoff multiplied by the stochastic discount factor has an expectation which is equal to the initial price, and you can assume that the stochastic discount factor has mean one, <coughs> or if you do not have a zero interest rate, that it has. Um, the expected value equal to 1 over the, um, the value of the risk-free asset at time 1. In a continuous time setting, the analog of this condition is that you must have the Martingale property for all the assets at the same time. Okay? So given any two times, S and T, you know that the expected value of M time S is equal to the value of m time s at the earlier time. Okay? So, the relation between the Martingale measure and the stochastic scan factor is in fact quite straightforward. If you have a strictly positive stochastic scan factor, you get a Martingale measure and vice versa. And we are going to see this shortly. The relation that there is between the Martingale measure and the stochastic scan factor that you get from it is that the stochastic scan factor is generally equal to the conditional expectation of the adon nicodem de derivative of the Martingale measure with respect to the original measure divided by the risk free asset. Okay? And vice versa, if you have a Stochastic scan factor, you just multiply by the risk free asset, and this becomes your Radon Nicodem derivative at the final time. Okay, now notice that even for the simplest models, for, for example, Bachelier, for Samuelson, you name it, in general you cannot con construct an equivalent Martingale measure on the entire open interval zero plus infinity, because if you look at what is happening in these models, for example, the radon nicodem density will become more and more singular as the horizon pushes forward. So you will be able to change your measure on any compact, but not on the entire horizon. Okay? And this is completely normal. It doesn't mean that there is any arbitrage in these markets. Okay. So just a quick reminder. For, from uh, um, probability, this goes under various names. One of the names is Bayes formula, even though probably Bayes would not recognize it as his own. But <coughs> in any case, the idea is that if you want to take a conditional expectation under an equivalent measure, what you have to do is to take the conditional expectation under the original measure of the random variable under consideration multiplied by the Don nicodin density. And this is intuitive enough, okay? The part that is easily forgotten is that you have to divide by the conditional expectation of the Don nicodin de density itself, okay? And that this equality is true, of course, on the set where the Don nicodin density is strictly positive. And in particular, if you're dealing with equivalent measures, as we do when we um, consider Martingale measures in finance, then this is the entire set. So you just write almost surely. <coughs> so 
how does the proof go? The proof comes from the definition of condition expectation, essentially. Okay, so what is a condition expectation? It is by definition condition expectation of x under q conditionally at time t is that random variable which satisfies the condition that the expected value of q of such random variable times any t measurable, ft measurable random variable y is equal to the expected value of x itself times y under q. Okay, so this definition of condition expectation under q, the same property holds under p for the definition. Okay, so we start out from this inner equality, which is just the definition of condition expectation. Then on the right hand side, what do we do? Well, here we're going to take this expectation of xy under q. By definition, this is the expectation of xy times dq over dy over dp under p. Okay. Then we can bring in using the tower property of condition expectation, uh, condition expectation at time t. Y will come out of the condition expectation at time t because it is t measurable. dq over dp will not in general. So we are left with this expression here. On the other hand, if we look at this equality, here we are just using the change of measure again between p and q. So what is this expectation under q? It is the expectation of the same object times dq over dp under p. Now, this is by definition t measurable. Y is also t measurable. So if we take again a tower property of under time ft, what we are going to get is that this part comes out and this part comes out. The only part that doesn't come out is the Adonic Godin density, which is not necessarily f little t measurable. Okay? So now we have that this quantity is equal to this quantity, which means that in particular, at these these two expressions have to be the same for any choice of y and since this expression and this expression is also ft measurable this means that they have to coincide okay and this is exactly what we want to prove okay so the base formula is just an implication of the definition of condition expectation and now we're going to use it to establish a one-to-one -one relation between stochastic scan factors and material measures so the proposition says that if you have a stochastic scan factor <coughs> that is strictly positive here I forgot to say it okay but I will update the slides but for the video let's just put it on record a strictly positive stochastic scan factor corresponds to a material measure which is defined by this identity. So the adonic of the density is equal to the stochastic scan factor multiplied by the risk free asset price. Okay? And this is true for any time capital T. It will not be true for the entire open interval 0 plus infinity because then typically the adonic of derivative will become singular and in most models it becomes in fact zero almost surely okay which is certainly not a reasonable change of measure so where does this uh, equality comes from it comes directly from the base formula that we defined earlier so you start off with for example the assume that you have a stochastic scan factor and let's check that this equality gives you a material measure, you have to check that the discounted price of some asset, so this is the discounted price, this is the expectation under Q, then you have to check that this is equal to the value of the discounted asset, not a time T, but a time S. Okay? The way that you do this is that you just uh, apply base formula. Base formula tells you, well, to calculate this condition expectation under Q, you have to calculate the same condition expectation under P times the adon nicotine density, which is this one. And then you have to divide by the, the expectation of the adon nicotine density. On the denominator, you use the Martingale property 
of the stochastic scan factor times the risk free asset, so you have it <coughs> by definition. On the numerator, <coughs> you use the tower property, and then you use again the property of the stochastic scan factor, which makes all prices martingales when you multiply by it. And what you are getting is that, therefore, here you have the expected value of P under P of ST times MT, and this is exactly what you wanted because it is MT, MS, SS, and the MS will cancel out. Okay, and vice versa. If you have a martingale measure, you can repeat the same steps, and you will see that the uh, stochastic scan factor will uh, satisfy uh, the martingale property when multiplied by any asset. Okay, so. Now, what we have learned in general, we want to specialize in uh, diffusion models. And diffusion models are usually described by one safe asset and d risky assets. The safe asset we define as the one with index zero. The risky assets are all the others. We take, for the construction of these diffusion models, n Brownian motions. So, not necessarily the same number of Brownian motions as we have assets, but uh, possibly more. And then we take a safe rate, which is used to describe the uh, risky asset, sorry, the safe asset. In particular, we are assuming that there is such a rate. In general, you have no guarantee that the uh, safe asset will be a stochastic process which admits this representation, but for all practical purposes, this is what. Uh, um, you're going to do in any application that is not particularly um, unrealistic. The way we define the risky asset prices is by this multivariate diffusion. So this looks a bit informal, but in fact it isn't. I will uh, shortly argue why. So we want to take a bunch of stochastic processes, mu i's, where i is varying between 1 and d as excess returns, okay? So the drifts are going to be defined by the safe rate plus the excess returns. And then we're going to have another bunch of stochastic processes. This time it will be d by d for a volatility matrix, okay? Uh, sorry, not d by d, but d by n because we have D assets, but n bound emotions. Okay, so sigma will be a rectangular matrix d by n of stochastic process. <coughs> and on top of this, we define the covariance matrix to be sigma times sigma transpose. Okay, I'm going to use the prime as uh, the transpose symbol. So in particular, this is going to be d by d, because you get d by n times n by d. Now, the question is whether this equation makes sense at all, okay? In other words, if I give you mu, if I give you r, and if I give you sigma, does s, a stochastic process which satisfies this equation, exist? This is not a big deal. The way that we... Uh, check the existence is by defining an additional process which we call the return process which should really be called the cumulative return process and it is precisely the integral of the right hand side here okay so all we need here are conditions on mu r and sigma so that this return process is well defined this is not difficult to achieve. All you need is that the integral of mu plus r is integrable, almost surely, and that the integral of the covariance matrix is finite, almost surely. If you have this, then you know that sigma will be integrable with respect to the binary motion itself. So under these conditions, you know that big R exists. And if big R exists, you can define S to be the stochastic exponential of big R, defined as the exponential of big R minus half the quadratic variation of R. And you know that, but Ito's formula tells you that if you 
look at the dynamics of S, so if you calculate the differential of S, it satisfies precisely this property that ds over s is equal to the argument of the stochastic exponential, which is in this case r, which is precisely what you, you wanted. Okay? So the definition of a diffusion model is quite straightforward. All you need is the integrability of the drift and the square integrability of the diffusion, almost surely, and then you are set. You can write this expression without worrying about whether it makes sense or not, because it does. Okay, <coughs> so what happens if uh, here I have been a bit, uh, um, let's say, nonchalant, meaning that I have taken the stochastic exponential of a possibly vector valued process. What do you do if you have a vector valued process? You simply define the stochastic exponential component wise. So you take the stochastic exponential of x to have ith component equal to the stochastic exponential of the ith, ith components of x. Okay? And if you do it like this, then you get exactly what we wanted here. Okay? Okay. Now, so what we need to do now is to understand whether the terms mu and sigma deserve the names that they are typically given. So mu is typically called the expected return, excess return, and sigma is typically called the volatility. So if this is true, if this has any resemblance with what the words mean, then it must be that the condition expectation of RT plus epsilon minus RT divided by epsilon should be equal to mu t. Okay? Likewise, we should have that the variance of rt plus epsilon minus rt divided by epsilon should be equal to sigma t squared. Okay? If this is true, then the words are used properly. If this is not true, then the words are just false advertisements. Okay? And the question is, what do we need to make sure that the advertisements are not false. So, this is actually tricky because you need that the integral of sigma dw is a true martingale. If this is a true martingale, then the expect condition expectation of this is going to be zero. And when you take the expected value of this quantity, the stochastic integral will disappear. So that the expected value of this is only given by this part. Okay? If this is not a true martingale, but just a local martingale, then the expected value of this may not be zero, and uh, mu is a false advertisement when you call it uh, expected return, excess return, because it's not. It's just one part of the expected excess return. So we want conditions under which the quantities are what they're supposed to mean. And I'm giving you some sample conditions. I'm not claiming that these are the most sharp that you can find around. In fact, they're certainly not. But they are general enough so that most of the time in applications, these are satisfied. So, for example, you are in good hands if you know that the supremum of the drift is locally integrable, and if the supremum of, sorry, the squared drift, and also if the supremum of the squared volatility is locally integrable. Okay? If you are under these conditions, then you can actually establish these equalities that we like. Okay? So the proof is quite straightforward. You can check this, you know without uh, any trouble. In fact, this is why these are conditions that are simple. You can generalize them depending on the model you're working with, but in many cases these are fine. So, for example, with these integrability conditions, you know, certainly know that this is a matic, okay? Because sigma s squared is going to be integrable 
and therefore this is a true mountain. <coughs> so you can use Lebesgue's theorem when you calculate this, and you can bring the limit inside the integral, and this will give you precisely the value of mu at time t. Okay? So for sigma, it goes exactly uh, the same way. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But it is important to know that you need conditions. So if you are working, for example, with some uh, state local mapping, like the inverse three-dimensional Bessel, which is so dear to um, some people, then the mu is not the expected return. Okay? And uh, when you find the paradoxes, all of these paradoxes are driven by the failure of this uh, hypothesis, essentially. Okay, now next we want to understand what is a stochastic discount factor in a diffusion model. So, in a diffusion model, it turns out that the stochastic discount factor have a very particular structure. We don't have to define them just as general processes, we can just look at what they do locally. So, in particular, if we are working with the Brownian diffusion, we have the so-called predictable representation property, which says that any local matter is in fact a stochastic integral with respect to Brownian motion. So instead of working with any local matter M, we can work with the integrand which identifies it, H. Even more, we any positive local matter strictly positive, I should say, local matter, can be written as a stochastic exponential. So, we don't even have to work with the integral h, we can work with the integral lambda, which is the integral of the stochastic exponent. Okay? And this is the most attractive representation for a stochastic discount factor, because when we look at the matter property of ms, where S is any asset in our market, then we know that if this is a Martingale, then it must also be a local Martingale. Okay? And the Martingale property is the one that we want, but the local Martingale property is the one that it's easiest to check, and it is also an essay condition. So we start by looking at what are the implications of the local Martingale property for the stochastic discount factor. So here, yeah, if you look at uh, let's say, informally, the product rule for um, ms, because we know that both s and m are strictly positive, we can divide freely by both s and m, and we can see that df ms divided by sm is equal to ds over s plus dm over m, okay, plus d cross variation of sm divided by SM. So, what is ds over s? Well, what we care about is just the drift, okay? The uh, diffusion term, we are just going to write it here among the local particle part, because we do not care about what is happening here, we do not have any restrictions about this. dm over m, well, this is just going to be minus the interest rate plus a local matting part. So it doesn't have any implications. The part that is going to add the drift is the cross variation of SM divided by SM. What we get here is that M will give us a term in dm over M which looks like lambda dw. Okay? And when we take the cross variation of lambda dw with sigma dw, which comes from ds over s, what we get is precisely sigma lambda dt. Okay? So, this is written in differential form because it's easier. Of course, it makes sense only in integral form, but when you write it in integral form, it becomes really messy by multiplying by sm here. But at the end of the day, the equalities that you're going to check are exactly the same, so this is the way that is cleanest to look at. 
So what we know is that MS has to be a local martingale, okay? So if MS is a local martingale, it means that the drift here must be zero, which means in particular that mu plus sigma lambda has to be zero, okay? And this puts the restriction on our integrand lambda, which identifies a stochastic discount factor. So, if you have as many assets as you have Brownian motions, then this is a, these are n equations in n unknowns, and they identify only one value of lambda. Okay? If, in general, you have d assets but n Brownian motions, these are d equations, because you have one equation for each asset, each of them has to be a Martingale when you multiply by a stochastic discount factor, but n unknowns. So this is not going to identify one solution, it will identify infinitely many. And uh, in the case of a unique solution, lambda will be written as minus sigma inverse mu, and this is called a complete market. If you have many solutions, and this is an incomplete market, you're going to write any solution as any other plus some h, where h is in the kernel of sigma. Okay? And sigma here is, of course, a d by n matrix. So you have an infinite solution trace. Now, the question is the following. If I find the value of lambda, did I find the stochastic discount factor? Well, maybe. Okay? Maybe, because all you know if you find lambda is that now you have a nice local martingale. Okay? Does that guarantee that MS is going to be a martingale? Nope. No guarantee. Okay? But, at least, you have something that wants to be a, st a stochastic discount factor, so you have a candidate for a stochastic discount factor. You can check whether it is indeed a stochastic discount factor or not. In the case of complete market, it is a make or break proposition. Either you find that this is a stochastic discount factor, or there isn't any. And if there is no stochastic discount factor, there is something really wrong in the market, because, in fact, I didn't prove this to you because I showed you only that a stochastic discount factor is a sufficient condition for the absence of arbitrage, but you could prove some uh, reverse version of the theorem which tells you that if there is no stochastic discount factor, then maybe there is not a strict arbitrage, but there is something called as a free lunch, okay? And a free lunch is a asymptotic arbitrage. But one way or the other, there's something really wrong with the market if the lambda that you have found does not work in a complete market. If you are in an incomplete market, the situation is more hazy because you have a bunch of infinitely many possible candidates. Some of them can work, some of them may not work, or maybe none of them works. Okay? So, most of the time, if the model that you have defined makes sense, there will be uh, some relatively easy stochastic discount factor that will work, okay? So, for example, one simple way to look at this is to take some lambda that works and then try that one, okay? Or if you have a more complex representation of the lambda, you can take the part that makes this a martingale and use it and take the other part, set it equal to zero and see whether this works. This is known as the local martingale measure for those, who, sorry, the locally risk minimizing martingale measure for those of you who know uh, about it. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Okay. Now, let's look at what is happening in the models that we described at the beginning. So, what happens, for example, in the Summerson model, also known as dramatic Brownian motion? So here there is just one candidate. All the quantities that I have defined here are constants. So you only have lambda equal to sigma inverse mu, where mu is a vector of n constant, sigma is a matrix n by n, and it is strictly um, positive definite, of course. 
So the only stochastic discount factor you can define here is the, exp the um, stochastic exponential of minus sigma inverse mu w. Okay, is this a matter? Well, certainly. You just write it explicitly, and you check that it has expected value exactly equal to one. And if you have a exponential matting starting from one with expected value exactly equal to one, then it is also matting because it is a local matting. It is bounded from below, therefore it is a super matting. So the mean can only go down. If it doesn't go down, it means that it is a matting. Okay, so easy to check. And this is just a calculation. All you need to do this to, to check this is to remember that when you have a normal random variable, the expected value of the exponential of the normal random variable is equal to the exponential of the expected value of the normal random variable plus half the variance. Okay, and this is the half the variance that you have to add. Okay, so if you have a positive interest rate, nothing changes. Well, just one thing changes. You have to divide the stochastic discount factor by the usual um, time discounting and that's your new discount factor and that's all. Okay. So in general what is important to keep in mind about the stochastic discount factor is that it has two parts. One part is just time value of money so it is the discounting that you do for you know, even deterministic cash flows you have to bring back the interest rate when you value the payoffs that take place in the future. And the second part is the risk premium and this is the part where you have a stochastic component and this is the part where the stochastic discount factor is adjusting the mean of risky assets so that they become all matrices. Okay? So this is the time series component, in other words, and this is the cross-sectional component which equalizes the expected value of all assets regardless of risk levels. Okay, now let's look at the Bachelier model. Okay, so this was the stochastic discount factor in the Samuelson model. What happens in the Bachelier model? Well, we check again the local matrix condition. We get exactly the same condition as before. So we get again that lambda t should be equal to minus sigma inverse mu. So we get the same unique discount factor. So I argued at the beginning that Samuelson model is a substantial improvement over the Bachelier model, but not really. Okay? When we look at this from an optimal investment point of view, they are actually the, the same model. They are both complete markets. There is just one stochastic discount factor. And the stochastic discount factor is the same. So this means that any payoff that you can generate in the Samuelson model, you can also generate in the Bachelet model, and vice versa. The only difference is that if you need a certain payoff a certain strategy, a certain trading strategy in the Samuelson model to generate that payoff, you will have to change it in the Bachelier model and vice versa. But at the end of the day, any random variable that you can get from this market, you can also get from the other market and vice versa. Okay? So the stock prices look different in the Bachelier model and the Samuelson model. But the investment opportunities, meaning the family of random variables that can be generated in one market or the others, are exactly the same. Okay? So if you take the same two parameters, mu and sigma, for Bachelier and Samuelson, they will give you exactly the same trading opportunities and they will give you exactly the same price for the same payoff. Okay? So this is important to understand because when one works with portfolio choice and one wants to find optimal uh, investment strategies, there are two parts of the story. One part is 
how happy does this market make me? Okay? So, and this depends on the investment opportunities. And the other question is, what do I have to do to become as happy as possible in this market? And this is a more technical question which has to do with how the stock prices are presented in one market versus the other. So you can have exactly the same investment opportunities even though the trading strategies are different as it happens with these two situations. Okay, which brings us to the possible representations of payoffs. Okay. There are some representations which are called additive, and the simplest of them all, here I am assuming to have a zero interest rate for simplicity, so that we don't have to worry about time discounting. If you have, if you call theta the number of shares, as I called earlier, then you can define a uh, payoff at time capital T as the initial capital little x plus the integral of theta in ds, where s is your stock price. Okay? So this is the additive representation in terms of number of shares. <coughs> Sorry. Another way to describe a payoff is not in terms of number of shares, but in terms of positions amounts. Okay? So the question here is no longer how many shares do you have in a certain stock, but how much money do you have in that stock? Okay? And we can call that H. Of course, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you tell me theta, then H is just theta times S. And if you tell me H, well, theta is just H divided by S, okay? assuming that S is non-zero. So if you rewrite the same payoff in terms of H, all you have to do here is to divide and multiply by S. Here you get the S over S, which is just the return process, and here you get H. Okay? So you can either write the payoff as the initial capital plus the accumulation of price increments times number of shares, or the accumulation of amounts times returns. Okay? And they are exactly the same thing. Now, there's also these two are the two main additive representations of payoffs. There is also multiplicative representation, which is the one typically used for power utilities and logarithmic utilities. And this is also the most common in financial planning, for example. And it is in terms of portfolio weights, otherwise known as fractions of wealth invested in various assets. So if you are telling me that you have 20% of your wealth in a certain stock, you are not telling me theta, you are not telling me h, you are telling me pi. Where pi is theta times s divided by x, where x is precisely how much money you have today. Okay? So what is the relation between these two representations and this representation here? Well, here you can write the payoff not as a stochastic integral, but as the stochastic exponential of a stochastic integral. Okay? So this is straightforward. All you have to do is to start from this representation in differential form, which is dx equal theta ds. Then you divide and multiply by s, as you did here. So you get dx equal theta s ds over s, which is theta s dr. And then you again divide and multiply this time by x, and so you get dx over x equal pi dr. And if dx over x equal pi dr, it means that x is equal to the stochastic exponential of pi dr. Okay? So, <coughs> formally, all these representations are the same. If one is careful, this representation is possible only if you have strictly positive wealth at all times. So here there is no requirement at all that the payoff should be positive at the end. Okay? Neither there is here. In fact, you can always go from here to here as long as S is, for example, strictly positive at all times, okay? 
All you need is to be strictly different from zero at all times. But this one is fundamentally different. Okay? For this one, it is already embedded in the representation that this is strictly positive. Here, not strictly positive, almost surely, cannot be represented, right? Is this an uh, artificial example? Not really. Just consider a buy and hold strategy. You buy one share of one set at time zero and you hold it at time one until time one and you do nothing between zero and one. Well, if your stock price is, let's say, one and it can move around all the way between zero and plus infinity as it does in the Samuelson model, suppose that you start with less than one, suppose that you start with one half, so you borrow another half. Now you have one and you buy one share, so you have a twice leverage position. Can you buy and hold? Not necessarily. You can buy and hold and stay strictly positive only if your stock price doesn't go down more than 50%. If it does, then you're going to hit zero. And if you hit zero, then this representation doesn't make sense anymore. Okay? So whenever you're dealing with these representations, it's always a good idea to make sure that it actually makes sense depending on the application under consideration. Another important aspect about these representations is that if you choose the right representation, the portfolio choice that you are, problem that you're studying may be trivial. If you choose the wrong representation, it may be completely impossible. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, before we can go to our portfolio choice problems is to introduce a few some a few basic concepts that we need about convex duality do you want me to make uh, a break now do you want to make a break or not shall i continue i continue okay <coughs> so this is just a Simple reminder, which I presume you know already from uh, previous uh, convex analysis lectures. So we define the lesander franchel transform of a function u, which can take values in r and possibly in minus infinity, as the supremum of ux minus xy as x varies among all the real numbers. Now notice that the typical definition of the Zander Fenchel transform is in terms of inf and with the plus rather than the minus. Okay. In finance uh, this definition that I'm introducing is more convenient because we want to typically maximize the utility of a payoff rather than minimizing the energy of something. So this turns out to be the one that is more intuitively clear. At any rate, this definition also extends to the case of a function from Rd to R, and the definition is exactly the same. All you have to do is to replace this product with the scalar product between x and y, and also the argument y is going to be uh, Rd valued, of course. Okay. So, this is just a definition coming out of the sky. Right now, it is not yet clear what is the application. So, notice that in general, V is a convex and discreasing function. This is pretty clear. Okay. Now, when I say decreasing, of course, I am referring to the case where the function is from R to R. That is convex is pretty obvious because this is the supremum of a bunch of lines. If you look at these functions as functions of y, these are just lines. If I take the supremum of many linear functions, I always get a convex function. So convexity is guaranteed. Notice also that if you start off with u to be continuous differentiable, then you also v get v to be continuously differentiable. I'm not going to prove this, but can be done by hand. Okay, and what we want to keep in mind about this convex dual function, which I have defined, is the following. 
few properties, okay? Some of them are quite trivial, and uh, the first one in particular is the most usual, but it's also the most trivial. First is that u of x is always less than or equal than vy plus xy. Why? Because x, uh, v is defined to be the soup of ux minus xy. Okay? So this is trivial. Second, that u of x is equal to vy plus xy if and only if u prime x is equal to y. Okay? Here, notice that I am keep keeping the differentiability of u as a standing assumption. So, we do not have problems with kinks of u, and u is always guaranteed to have a single slope at any point. And finally, notice that if u is concave itself, so the definition of convex dual can be given in general, the original function u does not need to be concave, okay? but if it is concave, there is no loss of information when you go from u to, y, to v. You can come back from v to u by just taking the usual lesson differential transform. Okay? You can just take the inf over y of vy plus xy, and this will give you back your original u. Okay? So what this is saying is that essentially, if you're dealing with concave functions, you can uh, look at u or look at v, whichever is most convenient in the situation, and there will be no loss of information. Okay, I'm going to skip the proof. This you can find um, in Rockefeller, or if you want a finance book, uh, uh, you can look at the book of Fulman and Sheed. Um, it's a very simple argument, and uh, I'm not going to discuss it in more detail. Now, what I want to spend a few minutes on are the applications that you can obtain with this definition. Okay? So in particular, if you have u to be the logarithmic utility, which is the simplest utility you can consider whenever you work in portfolio choice problems, then the associated v is going to be something which looks like a log, if it is in fact minus log y minus 1. If you are working with power utility, so if u is something like xp over p, then you get that v is also of power type, but the exponent will be the conjugate gate exponent, okay? So the value of q such that 1 over q plus 1 over p is equal to 1. And if you are working with exponential utility, which is another uh, popular utility function for certain properties, then what you get here is an entropy-like function of the form y log y, okay, up to some uh, constant alpha. And so, for these cases, there is a simple expression of the dual of the utility function, and whenever you want to work with the dual, you can simply switch to these associated dual utilities. So, this is a privilege that we have for these particular utility functions. Notice that if you try something more fancy, like a mixture of powers, okay, the dual of this is going to be a nightmare. Okay? I mean, it exists, it's unique, etc., but if you try to write it explicitly, it's not nice. So, why do we care about dual utilities at all? Because they can make optimal investment problems very easy, sometimes. So, the basic theorem, which is in fact more like an observation, but it's very useful, so we call it theorem nevertheless, is that if you have a utility function, u, you call v its dual, and then you have a set of payoffs which is a subset of a family of payoffs x included in some subspace defined by some stochastic scam factor m. Okay? So notice that the setting is relatively general here. I'm not saying that any payoff that satisfies this condition is a payoff that you can buy. I'm saying that all the payoffs that you can buy, which are the one in this subset C, are contained in one such set, 
and that if you can buy two payoffs you can also mix them up so I am assuming that the set of payoffs that you're dealing with is convex set of payoffs okay so this is a setting that includes many situations in particular it does include incomplete markets because if you take this inclusion to be an equality then this would be a complete market defined by this stochastic scan factor m but if you take just the simple inclusion this is just an incomplete market in, in which m is one of the many stochastic scan factors okay so the given these definitions the theorem says that for any payoff that you can afford the expected utility of that payoff will be less than or equal than the expected dual utility of this stochastic discount factor multiplied by some Lagrange multiplier y which is strictly positive plus xy okay and this is an inequality which is true for any Lagrange multiplier y and any stochastic discount factor m okay so this gives you what is known as an a priori upper bound okay it tells you that if you want to know an upper bound on how happy you can be in this market calculate this quantity and you're guaranteed that you will never be happier than that okay even if you don't know what is the optimal payoff even if you don't know whether there is an optimal payoff it cannot get any better than this so this is the upper bound part the more operational part of the theorem is the one that tells you that if you find a payoff which meets two actually three conditions first the payoff needs to use all the money you have okay so the expected discounted value of your payoff has to be equal to the initial capital second the marginal utility of your payoff is proportional to the stochastic discount factor m star which saturates the budget equation then you know that this x star is the best optimal payoff okay so notice what you have to find here okay you have to find three things you have to find x star you have to find m star and you have to find y star that's a lot to require okay it's not just you need to have one illumination you have to get three illuminations basically in fact if you look at this you only have to get two illuminations okay because if you find some m star and y star then x star is implied automatically as u prime inverse of the right hand side however you also have to check that this is satisfied okay so there is one setting in which this theorem basically tells you everything that you need to know about the problem and that's the setting of a complete market if you are a complete market then you know that there are not many stochastic discount factors to go around there's just one if you only have one stochastic discount factor then here there is only a one parameter family of possible payoffs that can be optimal and they are all defined by the equality x star equals u prime inverse of ym so how do you determine y which is the only thing that remains to be determined well you determine the only y that is going to satisfy this budget equation and this is going to be the only y that works okay of course there are many things that can go wrong there could be no y that satisfies this budget equation there could be <coughs> well no, that's the only thing that can go wrong well the other thing is that this maximum could be plus infinity but you can easily check whether this is happening by calculating this expected value in the uh, at the beginning okay so <coughs> this theorem basically is the basic 
fact about duality method the way that duality is useful is the to the extent that this theorem can be applied when you can use this theorem then you're in good shape when you cannot use it then duality is not so useful okay so how does the proof go it's quite simple actually you take any payoff x look at what is inside the expectation you know that for any x and so in particular for any for the entire random variable big x u of x is less than or equal than vym plus yxm okay this is true as an inequality almost surely between two random variables now you pass to the expectations when you pass to the expectation the expected utility is less than or equal than the expected value of this plus the expected value of that now you know by assumption that x is in c and for any x in c the expected value of xm is less than or equal than little x so you can estimate this from above with xy and here you have already your initial upper bound so in particular you can you know that this is true for any y and it is true for any x so you can take the soup on the left hand side you can take the if on the right hand side and now you have this upper bound okay which is the sharpest you can get under the conditions now what do you need to get the equality well to get the equality here you need this to be an equality and you need this to be an equality for this to be an equality you need the expected value of xm to be equal to x that's the condition we mentioned here okay? to get this to be an equality you need the inequality between random variable to be an equality and this gives, is given you by this property of the dual function that u of x is equal to vy plus xy if and only if u prime x is equal to y okay which by the way this is just the usual first order condition that you get if you take the derivative of the right hand side with respect to x sorry the derivative of the right hand side here with respect to x and you set it equal to z okay so it's quite intuitive so bottom line what we have is that if these two conditions are satisfied this is an equality this is an equality so now we have an equality here if we have an equality here between some x and some m what do we know we know that for this particular x the upper bound is satisfied so if the upper bound is satisfied it means that any other x cannot do any better than this particular x so this means that this is the optimal x okay and this is why the duality is particularly useful in a portfolio choice because it gives you an a priori upper bound that doesn't depend on the payoff and then if you find a payoff that hits this a priori upper bound you know automatically that it is the best no matter what the other payoffs are doing okay okay so let me show you some implications of this general theorem which is true for any utility function so the first one is with logarithmic utility okay so one of the confusions or to the unnecessary complications let's say that you get in this theorem is that the the Gange multiplier y is hovering both on the right and on the left so when you try to make the bound as sharp as possible this is a quantity that in general for any utility function u and therefore for any general v you cannot solve for this inf explicitly but for most utility functions that you use in practice which basically boils down to log power and exponential you can actually get rid of the inf and you can see for example with log utility that the expected log of any return in the market is always less than or equal than minus the expected log of the of any stochastic scan factor okay so here i have already solved for the lagrange multiplier it's gone and this is the resulting upper bound that you get for logarithmic utility you can 
find this yourself. There are two ways to find this. Okay, one is the mechanical way. You just take this upper bound, you plug here log utility, here the dual of the log, so minus log y minus one. You, you take the inf over y, which is a trivial calculus problem, and that's what you get. Okay. The other way. So there is a meta theorem here that any of these duality inequality you can always get also by using Jensen's inequality under some wise change of measure. Okay? For log utility, the wise change of measure is not wise. You don't have to change measure. So you can just look at Jensen's inequality for the budget equation, expected value of xm less than or equal to y. Then you can calculate the expected value of log xm. The expected value of log xm will be less than or equal than the log of the expected value of xm. And from there, you will get exactly this equation. Okay? What this is telling you is that if you know something about the stochastic scan factor in a complete market, for example, it tells you everything about the happiness you can reach in that market. So whether you're working with Bachelier or Samuelson, this is the same because the stochastic scan factor is the same. So if you can reach this equality in both markets, it will be exactly the same expected utility. With power utility, you can do the same thing, and it will look like this. Now, you can guess what is going to take you here. If you try to do it not in the mechanical way, you will probably need to use Hölder's inequality. Okay? And you will still find that the expected power utility is always less than or equal than some moment of the stochastic scan factor. Okay? That's all that matters in a power utility setting. If you work with exponential utility, you can do exactly the same exercise. If you want to do this with Jensen's inequality, you will have to switch under the risk Newton measure. And then it will work out. Otherwise, you can do the mechanical way, which always works. And in this case, you will see that the upper is essentially the stochastic scan factor. And this is also why, when you are dealing with exponential utility, the Martingale measure, which minimizes the dual exponential utility, essentially is called the minimal entropy Martingale measure. Okay. Okay. So I think this is a good time to stop, and tomorrow we're going to take from here, and uh, we are going to study portfolio choice. First using duality, and then using stochastic control, which will give us an uh, alternative mean of solving problems when duality doesn't go too far. Okay? Thanks for your attention.